And that actually brings me uh, to um, the next step uh, to the separation and detection um, by, for instance, HPLC UV or LCMSMS -MS within this analytical scheme for determination of mycotoxins. And when we, we see actually here <coughs> a quite a rapid transition uh, or impressive transition um, when uh, checking the uh, methods which are around for aflatoxin B1 uh, based on the results uh, uh, of uh, WHO and FAPAS. WHO, well, the World Health Organization, obviously. FAPAS, uh, the profici proficiency testing scheme um, offered by FERA in uh, York. And in 1978, you had actually a predominance of TLC methods in red, a couple of HPLC methods in <coughs> yellow, and some other methods uh, around 1990. Um, there was uh, already uh, as many HPLC methods uh, around as TLC-based methods, and now <coughs> TLC methods, I would say, are almost entirely um, restricted to uh, uh, developing countries, uh, to some field laboratories, uh, and there's a majority of HPLC methods. These HPLC methods, also with uh, some uh, with a percentage of ELISA methods, <coughs> are used uh, also uh, in combination or in uh, in uh, coupling not only with UV-based uh, uh, detection methods but also with uh, mass spectrometry. Well, <coughs> when we look at uh, the multi-analyte methods uh, which were available in 1998. Uh, we were actually back then very proud to be able uh, to distinguish between seralenone and its metabolites which are formed in the, in the liver and which are actually more estrogenic than its parent molecule <coughs> alpha and beta seralenol. Uh, at the same time, we were pretty uh, happy to be able to uh, distinguish between deoxynivalenol 3, 15 acetyldon fusarenone X, uh, and to perform that type of analysis with uh, gas chromatography coupled either to electron capture detector <coughs> or to uh, mass spectrometry. And uh, this method is actually still available, still in use by some labs, although it's um, increasingly been replaced by LCMS methods. But just from a chemical point of view, to demonstrate to you what actually is needed in order to be able to detect, to quantify uh, mycotoxins, uh, especially polar ones as nivalenol or deoxynivalenol. Uh, well, the prerequisite for any gas chromatographic technique is that your, that your substance has to be volatile enough to evaporate. Does deoxynivalenol evaporate quickly? No. It's, uh, too polar for that. Uh, so uh, in order to evaporate it, you need either high temperatures, but another prerequisite of gas chromatographic determination is not only evaporation, but also that this compound evaporates at the temperature where it's, where it is not decomposing, right? Because you want to have the entire <coughs> uh, active molecule. And uh, that can be done by so-called silanization step, for instance, with uh, tricell DPT, <coughs> which actually, uh, which is a, a commercial name, which introduces trimethyl silane groups uh, at the positions of the OH groups, and all of, a, all of a sudden, you get rid of the OH groups, you get rid actually of um, the, the uh, uh, hydrogen uh, bonding, uh, which uh, is otherwise there, and this molecule is then uh, ready to, in, to inject into the gas chromatogram, into the gas chromatograph uh, in order to detect it by gas chromatography. <coughs> Another possibility is uh, the addition of heptafluorobutyryl imidazole. Again, you get rid of the OH groups, so again, it's uh, evaporated at reasonable temperature, <coughs> and. I mentioned actually that there is a very common detector is the electron capture detector, as mentioned here, and the electron capture detector actually can detect compounds which have a high electronegativity. So they are actually have a high affinity towards electrons. 
And with that method, actually, you are introducing not only apolar bonding, but also a lot of fluorine atoms. And with the uh, introduction of these fluorine <coughs> atoms, uh, this compound is uh, becoming highly electronegative and therefore uh, increases the sensitivity of the method when detected by GCECD. The same is actually applied when performing GCMS measurements. However, the introduction of these fluorine groups is then not so, so beneficial because mass spectrometry <coughs> uh, is not dependent on these electronegative groups. Actually, the other way around, because there's also a problem with derivatization. Once you add a der derivatizing agent to your, to, your, um, to your sample, you also derivatize all the other components which are in your sample and not only the mycotoxins. So also, also your background noise will increase because all the, all the other components which you, don't in, uh, which you are not interested to, 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 to detect uh, will be fluorinated and thus give you actually um, an increased background noise. <coughs> well, this is uh, how our LCMS and this is how I, I looked like uh, 10 years ago. Uh, so you see uh, some transformation here as well. Um, the machines are getting newer, I'm getting older. And uh, that is actually in our Christian Doppler Laboratory, which is actually a, a huge national funding stream, uh, which can fund um, the res research of uh, uh, potentially high, uh, high, high, high potential research, researchers, about 60 are, are funded. Um, over a period of seven years, Franz Berthiller and Sabine are among those now. And um, that is the machine which we uh, obtained in 2003, our first LC tandem mass spectrometer. <coughs> and uh, when we look actually at the development just over the last eight years, this is just phenomenal. Yeah? So <coughs> we uh, uh, developed our first method with this QTRAP 2000, an LCMS method. We covered nine mycotoxins. Uh, we used the Microcept cleanup, so uh, we still use the cleanup. So now, actually, uh, that is not the case anymore. And we had a limit of detection of 65 picogram on the column. Yeah? Because when you, that is uh, kind of confusing, maybe we usually we talk about microgram per kilogram and so forth. But that is the actual total amount when you inject the 100 microliter of a certain concentration that you can detect, or you, you can calculate the actual total amount of the substance itself you are uh, injecting on the column and that was 65 picogram actually with a nice chromatogram. <coughs> so a couple of years later Michael Suljok was already in the team so you see uh, now they are twins uh, again an LCMSMS method was in place with 39 mycotoxins and for the first time without any cleanup and that is by the way uh, this 39 mycotoxin is the most cited paper in the history of, 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 of uh, the Center for Analytical Chemistry. Um, and it's the second most cited paper in the history of the IFA Tulln. So this does say something because uh, it really was a breakthrough. <coughs> 39 mycotoxins, no cleanup, and look, LOD for dioxinivalenol, 10 picograms. So it actually was again lowered down. That was actually extended to an 87 toxins 2007. 87 toxins is actually the uh, total number of toxins which are commercially available. So you cannot buy more standards, not, not even at BioPure Roma Labs. <coughs> um, and it was extended then through a network of collaborators which, uh, who were so kind to provide their, uh, their additional secondary metabolites to 186 <coughs> and which culminated, so to speak, in an LCMSMS method with electrospray with 350 fungal, bacterial, and um, plant metabolites uh, with uh, actually an LOD which went down from a 65 picogram on the column in 2005 to a 0.3 picogram on the column. So you see a tremendous development. And this low LOD, this high sensitivity, is actually also the reason why we are now also able to look into biomarkers, to look into the mycotoxins and their metabolites in the urine, because otherwise that's not possible, that's not feasible without any uh, proper sensitive uh, <coughs> instrumentation. We are now going high res. 
So uh, recently, uh, Sylvia, she performed also the first uh, high-res FT orbit rep MS measurements for, to detect mycotoxins in food. Uh, she screened for about 200 fungal metabolites. Uh, this was actually the, the purpose of this work was not to come up with a new world record, but to demonstrate whether or not uh, high-res SMS uh, and how easily or uh, difficult uh, that is uh, to uh, perform accurate quantification and that was also found to be appropriate. However, we are talking here about an instrument which is a 700,000 euro. So this is not the instrument you would buy in the first instance in order uh, to detect a couple of mycotoxins. That is also reflected LCMA by, by, by the uh, easy web of science uh, LCMS method for mycotoxin determination in the literature, quite impressive, published items in each year, 1993, I think two or three papers, one of those was from, was from our side in collaboration with the TU Vienna. Now we've got uh, about 80 papers, uh, 2013 will be higher, but the citation each year of LCMS based method uh, is quite impressive, so in 2000. Uh, uh, 11, this was about 800, and uh, a year later it's almost doubled. Yeah? So it's really an, almost an exponential <coughs> increase of LCMS SMS users. However, there are a couple of uh, <coughs> challenges which have to be met. Uh, careful optimization of the extraction solvent, I've alluded to, to that before, because we are injecting actually the diluted crude extract. So the idea is to get rid of the matrix components by diluting the matrix effects kind of to disappear to, to kind of to, to, uh, to a level where it almost is not present anymore by at the same time ensuring that there are still a couple of molecules left, a couple of mycotoxin molecules left which are still uh, feasible to be detected by a sensitive LCMS methodology. We've got a wide range of relevant concentrations. So in a multitoxin approach, you have got aflatoxin B1 at a, at a lower microgram per kilogram, whereas deoxynivalenol has a regulatory limit of 1,500. So that is also a challenge as far as working, uh, working uh, range linearity sensitivity is concerned. <coughs> uh, optimization of the chromatographic separation and also the ionization conditions is important. Um, have we got any signal suppression in the electrospray uh, or matrix effects? So that cannot be discussed now in, in every detail in my short introduction here. You will learn about this uh, during this week and uh, also during next week. <coughs> and certainly we go from screening towards quantification. It's not only that we can say qualitatively this compound is there, we can actually quantify the concentration and that is what counts. Uh, just to give you an idea on chromatography, <coughs> uh, elution of fumonas and uh, of fumonas is at neutral pH. You see, uh, FB1 has a tailing. H H uh, FB2 is almost uh, uh, impossible to, to, to find a peak. Once you reduce the dissociation of the carboxylic function of the carboxylic acid of the fumonasin by adding um, uh, ammonium. Uh, acetate uh, or acetic acid, uh, this uh, dissociation reduction actually uh, immediately uh, results into nice and sharp peaks which do not only contribute to a better sensitivity of the method but also <coughs> to a better uh, selectivity. Well, there is tandem mass spectrometry, that is the method of choice which uh, we have been using for the last decade. Uh, with uh, three quadrupoles, one selecting the molecular ion, then you've got a fragmentation uh, by the uh, collision with nitrogen, and then you select a third fragment. Uh, uh, in, in the third quadrupole, you select a fragment of, for instance, seralanone. So what you uh, actually perform is select a direction monitoring from a precursor to a product ion. This will all be dis uh, discussed by by, uh, by Franz, maybe he hasn't got such a nice video as I do. Um, so just to give you an idea on the, on, on the coming week or weeks, so after focusing your, your ions in a quadruple zero, uh, you have got another mass filter with an electromagnetic field in quadruple one with overlaying direct and uh, um, alternating current. Only the mycotoxin of interest in blue is able to migrate further uh, 
then collides with uh, nitrogen atoms in quadruple number two, fragments are produced, and then in quadruple number three, uh, again, through the application of a certain electromagnetic field, only the fragments which you have selected before are able to uh, migrate further to passage through quadruple number three and to reach the uh, detector. <clears throat> this is uh, another example with UPLC, so the next generation of LC is ultra uh, performance liquid chromatography, even smaller columns, even smaller diameters. Uh, where Elisabeth Varga has developed a method which covers 242 mycotoxins and those other uh, fungal and bacterial metabolites, um, where um, we had uh, re improves, um, improved chromatographic resolution. So that is actually with an uh, HLN instrument. Uh, all the other measurements were performed with uh, applied biosystems, and that met method was also published only uh, recently. <coughs> um, what is what matters in um, in LCMS is actually so-called matrix effects. So when you, you, when you still have got an API 2000 and you want to convince your boss that you need an, an update, uh, the, let's say uh, API 6000 or uh, whatever the company uh, brand names are, then show him this graph. Uh, you see here, uh, actually this is the graph uh, spiked in microgram per kilogram, uh, a sample, a maze sample. Uh, and here you, you find, uh, you see the found microgram per kilogram that actually this 45 degree line uh, is the one which you would like to end up with. But this is actually the graph which you will obtain due to a lack of ionization in the electrospray. Your uh, calibration graph uh, is uh, uh, not showing the slope which actually it should show only after uh, uh, adding a so-called internal standard or by purchasing an instrument which has a more effective um, ionization process in your electrospray so that uh, this uh, measurement is then not as uh, dependent on uh, matrix effect because the matrix components do interfere with the electrospray uh, process. And uh, you will also hear during the week about isotope dilution methods <coughs> where actually you add to your analyte of interest uh, which is displayed uh, in, in green, uh, also um, um, your, uh, sorry, which is displayed, uh, displayed in red. In green, you add your uh, internal standard, and the idea is by adding an internal standard, which is a standard which is the same component as the one you want to detect. Let's say for dioxinivalenol, um, you have um, uh, got um, um, 15 uh, carbon atoms, I think, then you have actually uh, a mass which is 15 higher when all C12 isotopes are replaced by C13 uh, isotopes. And uh, this is ideally an internal standard, is a standard which does either contain deuterium atoms or C13 uh, isotopes so that you've got the same molecule but it has a higher mass. And it, this uh, internal standard based on C13 material then undergoes the same losses during the sample preparation and you can directly compare the MS peak area or height by saying, okay, the ratio of the intensity of the internal standard to the analyte is the same as the concentration of the internal standard to the, your analyte of interest and then actually you can calculate uh, your, um, your concentration without the need even for <coughs> external calibration uh, by um, comparing uh, the results, for instance, that is your reference value of 470 um, with, uh, with your internal standard corrected. So you see actually when you use your internal C13 labeled standard, you find uh, almost exactly the levels which are certified. However, without any internal standard, you find actually much lower value that is, explains also the slower slope. No need to understand that right away, but kind of uh, already alluding to uh, the lectures to come. What is important is proper validation of any method, also including a multi-toxin method. <coughs> For each of these toxins, you have to uh, calculate LODs, uh, uh, LOQs, limits of modification. The overall so-called apparent recovery, uh, which is all kind of uh, in, a, in, a, in a range uh, which is uh, very convenient with lower microgram per kilogram for trichothecins, 
only for aflatoxins, uh, uh, multitoxin method should, had, uh, has to be further optimized in order to meet the regulatory standard. Apparent recoveries, uh, except for fumonisins and for aflatoxins, uh, in a, a very a good range, uh, with the limitation for fumonisin, uh, actually um, 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 the extraction procedure, which is not com as complete as it should be, with aflatoxins, the major limitation is actually signal suppression as a result of matrix components, which kind of hinder uh, the uh, a proper um, electrospray ionization process. So for the quantitative analysis, um, matrix match calibration is uh, therefore often required, so you do not perform a calib calibration sequence by just having different concentrations of your mycotoxins in a pure organic solvent. You perform a maize extract which is not contaminated or peanut powder extract which is not contaminated ideally with uh, aflatoxin or in any other mycotoxin and then you add, you spike your analyte of interest to the matrix extract and perform a matrix batch calibration or alternatively if available, using a CST 13 labeled standard. <coughs> this method for the multitoxin method has also been validated for a couple of matrices, which I'm not uh, wanting to go into detail here. But what is, so f what is the great thing about uh, multitoxin approaches is the fact that uh, you find very interesting new metabolites. Uh, here we found patolene in apple pear coffee residues in filter. Who would actually expect to find patolin in coffee residues in filter? Uh, Ocrodoxin A in cream fresh, fumonacin in garlic, bovaricin in onion and garlic, moniliformin in garlic. They're very high concentrations. But these were all visibly moldy foodstuffs. So this is not what you can expect when you kind of, I don't know, drink your coffee. You would not expect high levels of patolin there. But uh, this, is, uh, this is the range of toxic secondary metabolites which uh, you can detect. Uh, and which you would never find if you would not applying a multitoxin method because you would simply not um, look for these strange combinations. Yeah, well, I'm not going into detail of this. I've already uh, um, shown you in my previous uh, slides um, the, um, uh, the great range of different metabolites which you can detect uh, in uh, food commodities and also feed commodities once uh, you apply this multitoxin approach. Uh, what is quite interesting to see is that the regulated, the first regulated toxins on the list, dioxineval was only the 21st in frequency of all the toxins which we found. Uh, so uh, kind of um, an interesting finding and which is also in line with what uh, Gerd Schatzmeier said before, also with a high frequency of unusual toxins. Uh, we have also reported for the first time in natural contaminant food, uh, melagrin, agroglavin, uh, as uh, ergot alkaloids and other um, exotic um, metabolites which have not even, even been properly um, checked for toxicology yet. Another possibility besides LC tandem mass spectrometry is the use of LC time of flight mass spectrometry um, that has also been used for quantifying uh, a couple of mycotoxins. The advantage of TOF, and this will also be elaborated during the course of the week, is full scan sensitivity over a wide mass range, and you can actually apply a database screening even long after actual analysis. So that is, I think, the ideal tool, let's say, for checking the metabolite spectrum over a couple of years to, to check for potential influence of global warming. Why? Because in LC tandem mass spectrometry, one has to select the analytes before you perform the analysis. Here, you can actually select the analyte even 10 years after you have performed the analysis because you do a full screen of all the masses, masses which are there and don't select them beforehand. Problem, you need large storage uh, place in order to store this large volume of all this data. It takes longer. Uh, it's not as uh, sensitive. 